Welcome back to Phantom Sage Powers, where we discuss comics and heroes and, you know, a little of this, a little of that. We have been exploring the X of Swords crossover event, and we are at part three. If you haven't caught up to the previous parts of X of Swords that I've put out, please check the description or the tags in the video to get caught up. Picking up where we left off, we see Richter and Apocalypse have made it through the gate. Siren is helping him, but man, Richter is in bad shape. Like the guy that died trying to get to the Citadel in the first part of the story, that poisonous arrow is doing a number on him. Siren, she gets through the gate and she screams out for help as loud as she can. <coughs> Apocalypse is, is equally as messed up. Just then, Rachel, Dr. Cecilia Reyes, Doug, and several other X-Men have arrived to help get them to the healing gardens. Rachel gets a telepathic message from Monet and says, wait, you got one more. We need your help with this one. We see that it is Rockslide. He is dead and he is in pieces, bisected, and they are pretty much beside themselves with this loss. Dr. Reyes is inquiring as to what has happened to him and Polaris says that he's dead. She proceeds to move him, Dr. Reyes, and says, well, he's coming with me. She takes him to the Five to be resurrected. Saturnine is watching this whole event transpire from the Citadel. Polaris is feeling very guilty because she says she could have stopped what happened and could have probably stopped that blade. She just feels terrible. She's really, she's really down. While Saturnine is just like, not even really pressed about it. She's kind of mocking her a little bit. And she says, in the meantime, until that three days time, we're gonna go ahead and just shut this gate down. And she destroys the gate from her side. This appears to cause some kind of earthquake or seismic event that affects Lorna. M comes in and swoops up and takes her away. In the healing gardens, we see Monet and Rachel are trying their best to get into Polaris's mind. Polaris had passed out after some kind of backlash happened from the gate, but every time they try to get into her psyche, Saturnine has some kind of mental block or booby trap that kind of kicks them out. No, only the, the little rabbit can look, only the rabbit can look. And they're like, well, who the hell is the rabbit? And Polaris begins to wake up and she says, I think that, you know, I think she might be talking about me, but I don't understand why I am the one with this prophecy. I'm not a psychic and I'm not a, a magic person. I'm just like the wrong person for this gig, basically. In the healing garden, Richter and Apocalypse are recovering, but not really. They are actually really bad shape, especially Richter. It looks like he's not going to make it because as the healer comes and begins healing root magic on both of them, he really is focusing on Apocalypse. Apocalypse is like, are you gonna let him die? And healer is like, you know, he'll be brought back accordingly. It will probably just be easier anyway. When the healer says this, Apocalypse kind of freaks out and he attacks him and starts to kill him. Before he can kill him though, he is kind of attacked psychically and Apocalypse is seeing the horseman in his mind attacking him, but Rachel had sensed what was happening and was able to get him off healer. Rachel is saying, I don't know why you're seeing me the way you're seeing me, but she has to stop him from killing healer and all of a sudden she's kicked out of his mind. Cecilia Reyes is confused thinking that Rachel's just attacking Apocalypse. In actuality, what was happening is Apocalypse had went to what was equivalent to a psychic shock at seeing Richter dying. Polaris goes to see Charles Xavier and the Five to see about Rockslide and what's going to happen to him. She shows Charles Xavier what happened during the battle and how he died who in turn shows it to the five. And Charles puts her mind at ease and says, don't worry, we're going to get he and Richter resurrected. Polaris was like, oh, Richter died. Like, he, they were like, yeah, he died like not too long ago in the healing gardens, but we're about to go ahead and get them back on the board. 
Tempest kind of panics a little bit. She says they have never worked that fast before, and it usually takes, you know, a day or two to do one. And Charles says he has every bit of faith in them, and this is wartime, and they need to push themselves a little bit, but he knows that they can do this. So they reluctantly say, you know, okay, we can, you know, we're going to do it. So they do take two of uh, eggs, golden eggs, and they proceed to the sinking of the power of the circuit to get this, this process going. The process seems to go well, and both Rockslide and Richter hatched from their cocoons. Charles goes to Richter and downloads his psychic imprint and gets him uploaded back into his body. Tells him that um, Polaris has the rest of the information from the last couple of hours to fill in. It's a little bit of crazy information. Bear with me while I get Rockslide. They go. He goes over to Rockslide to get ready to download his psyche into him. But when he looks at Rockslide, he is kind of confused because he doesn't look the same. And all of a sudden, there's a weird psychic backlash. The whole five are hit with it. They're kind of knocked off their feet for a moment. Flashes of around the island at the different cradle points where the backups of the mutant psyches are. Because this is where he keeps backups on backups in case, you know, one is destroyed. He'll have an extra database. We even get a quick glimpse of Moira and no place. Polaris is shook. She does not know what's going on and she runs to Rockslide to help him but he is obviously something wrong and he is crumbling apart and he collapses. The five are panicking. Charles is still knocked out and they are trying to figure out what went wrong, what did we do wrong and they realize that something has tainted their resurrection process. They kind of go through the steps and say, it couldn't have been this, it couldn't have been that. The timing was good, so Tempest is not Tempest. Biology, Josh, he's got a lock on that, he's Omega. Egg comes to the conclusion that it must be his part of it, which are the embryos, the eggs, and something is tainted, they need to destroy them. So Josh breaks them down and destroys them immediately then rock slide begins to reform himself but he looks very different he looks skinnier he looks odd and polaris says you're not rock slide this creature looks very confused he doesn't really know what's going on charles wakes up and sees that they have destroyed the eggs and he freaks out he's like what have you done they thought that there was a corruption in the eggs so they destroyed them immediately they were kind of freaking out because they hadn't had a discussion on what to do about mishandled or failed resurrections and this is obviously not santos or rock slide they don't want to talk about a corrupted clone and what to do with it they don't even want to have that discussion They bring this rock slide to the Quiet Council with the five. Everybody's still pretty shaken up and nervous and confused about what happened. Proteus is saying that it's a failure. The resurrection was not our fault, but something is different about this. We should know what limitations are on this protocol. And obviously it has something to do with Otherworld because that's where he died. Charles says that makes sense because it's outside of regular time and space and it's out of their jurisdiction as far as the mental imprint getting that that information back. It destroyed all of his backups across all the cradles. And Mystique says, well, who is this? Hope says it's a roll of the dice. It's the possibilities that converge in other world. It's kind of like the center of the multiverse is possibility. So whatever we resurrect is going to be a mixture of many possibilities of what Santos could have been, but it's not really him. Charles is kind of talking through the other world and this whole technical side of the resurrection. When Emma just gets, gets frustrated, she's really upset that Rockslide is gone forever. Through his sacrifice is the only way we could understand what catastrophic failures we have made of everything. She's pissed. And this is the Emma that I love, the one that is for the children and for the youth, because she was like that with her Hellion. She was like that with her students a lot. While Charles sometimes is kind of cold, and it is the way he's talking about everything is very cold because Santos is gone. He, that man is dead. That's the true death. There's no resurrection from that. Emma goes on to say it really sickens her that you just behave so cavalierly when we've lost one of our youth. We have to call off this tournament, this reckless tournament. We cannot be going back into that gate again. It's just, it just can't happen. 
And Charles is very much reminding her that we had a bargain struck to defend Krakoa from <laughs> bloodlusting Araki, that the champions will likely choose to participate themselves and that it's kind of a predestined thing. Speaking of that, Magneto chimes in, this brittle daughter, where how are you with that? Are you deciphering the clues that Saturnine gave you? Polaris kind of starts to stammer and stutter. Magneto is always really hard on Polaris, but he starts to go in on her. He's like, how dare you dally? Like, we need to know this information or if we're going to survive. He tells her, just do the work, Polaris. Come on, like, get get it together. Charles is trying to tell him to calm down. But before any more discussion could be had, from one womb came two. Polaris drops Santos's pieces that she had left over as she goes into that trance again. A hero destined to brandish what the earth has swallowed and an echo doomed to yearn for what the stars have forsworn. Lost soul, an edge game, a lone warrior returns to a forge left ablaze. Sword in the stone, stationed in space, a young man born old, pilots a place. A father forsaken, a husband betrayed, an ancient treasure sharpens the death his children crave. Friends self, friends lost, out of one comes many, and to many comes one. Eight years gone in seconds from a childhood lost, comes a woman grown. Her only friends were weapons, her goal a blade, hers alone. Once goddess, once queen, one sword with which to split the sky in twain. Vibranium inlaid, a tempest contained, she is the wrath of the heavens, wielding a legacy. Ego death and broken stone, two wars waged by one champion alone. And after that, she snaps out of it like Professor Trelawney. I was like, what in the what in the prophecy is going on? And she's like, what happened? And Magneto is there to comfort her and say she's all right. She freaks out because she dropped the remains of Rock Slide, the original Rock Slide. She just grabs up the pieces and runs out. She's freaked out. In the healing gardens, Apocalypse is still laid out. He is not doing well, but, you know, he seems like he's kind of trying to recover a little bit. Magneto and Charles are there and they let him know that the resurrection protocols are offline until further notice because it kind of freaked out everybody what happened to Rock Slide and the eggs got destroyed. So they have to make another batch. And basically, you need to stay alive because you'll be gone for a minute if you die before everything's ready. Apocalypse is just beating himself up and saying that everything is about to come crashing down. The experiment has failed and they're like, whoa, 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 like, you know, calm down. It's not it's not over yet. Apocalypse is saying that something is wrong with me. I can feel something, an itch in my head like Saturnine's not quite done with me yet. And Magneto tells him this is just a minor setback for somebody who is making a lot of stupid choices. You need to man up and get back together and get back in this fight. The same words he probably should have been telling his daughter, but Polaris is busy doing her own work out here in the middle of these trees and she has taken Rock Slide's remains. In the hatchery, the five are there trying to get back on track with everything and Hope is asking where our rock slide remains. We flash to a place where Lorna was, where she had taken rock slide's remains, and she has constructed a circle, a kind of a sigil that was imprinted on her by Saturn 9. It was imprinted in a geo-electromagnetic kind of pattern that only somebody like her with her powers would be able to decipher and pick up on it. She felt it, but she didn't really know what it was until she started to construct it. This whole thing is a casting circle that will activate once each champion and their sword enter to their corresponding sigil and it will activate the circle and the portal will open and they'll be able to travel to Ament for this tournament. And she tells them that this circle is made of Rock Slide's remains and it is also a memorial and is to be a permanent fixture there on the island. It is, it is sacred. It is called the Sanctus Sacrum, the sacred sacrifice. And when this portal opens, we will march to slaughter the scourge who brought the unwelcome conflict to our doorstep that killed our poor brother. We failed Santo and we honor his sacrifice. We must make this death count. And I love this imagery of Polaris stepping into her purpose here, even though it's very sad. It's, it's actually really heartbreaking, but she knows what needs to be done and she's ready to go to battle. And from the back you hear, well damn, 
somebody's impressed, and it is Yeliana Rasputin herself, Magic. And she says, let's get this show on the road because I'm ready to go ahead and, <laughs> you know, get to killing. Basically, she pulls out her soul sword and hits up to the first sigil, slams her sword down, tink, and it lights up. She already knew she was one of the sword bearers, obviously. And she says, pound the war drums. They've got one sigil activated, and that's where I'm going to leave it. So, guys, I really love this story the way it started out. It started out very strong, and it set up this really cool, almost Mortal Kombat-style tournament that's going to be playing out over the course of these next couple of books. This riddle, this prophecy is really intriguing to me. I love stuff like this, and we get another info page of Cypher talking about this prophecy and trying to unravel this riddle rather and he goes through each part of it he talks about the eight years gone in seconds childhood loss the creature grown the young girl's friends and Eliana she says pretty much picked up on that was her she kind of was irritated by the way it was worded too it was kind of personal very crassly stated this says a beacon slices in the dark station in space a young man born old and he says hey did anybody want to talk to Cable about that one the friend self, friends lost, out of one comes many, and to many comes one. He does know a guy that talks like that, Doug says. Obviously, he's referencing Warlock, who is his friend and alien, a technarch that is a part of Collective. So I thought that was very clever the way that was worded. He also says Warlock can turn into a sword, though, and I can't. So maybe he's coming with me instead of me coming with him. But either way, we'll work that part out. Once goddess, once queen, once sword, which split the sky in twain, vibranium and laid, a tempest contained, the wrath of heavens, wielding a legacy. And he's like, this has to be Storm, right? It's kind of pretty. Someone should cross-stitch it for her house. I wish mine was like that one. Lost soul, an edge gain, a lone wanderer returns to forge left the blades. And he said he was stumped by this one, but Logan seems sure that the Muramasa blade is going to factor in here. And when he thinks about it, he says, lone wanderer, yeah, that makes sense. And as above, so below, from one womb came two, a hero destined to brandish what earth hath swallowed, an echo doomed to yearn for what the stars have forsworn. He says the twins, and the, what he thinks of is the Braddock twins. He thinks about Betsy and Brian Braddock. He was like, Brian's not a mutant, but I'm not sure which one is this supposed to be about. Ego death and broken stone, two wars ways, and one champion alone. He says Gorgon, who is a mutant that has joined the island, he came and showed up and he says that this was pretty much about him. So he kind of just has to take his word for it. And father forsaken, husband betrayed, an ancient treasure sharp as the death his children crave. Another person he has to take his word for it was Apocalypse, who says, you know, he's going and that is for him. So I love, 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 love the way this starts off. Tell me, guys, are you loving the energy of Ten of Swords storyline? The tarot, the magic mixed in, other world stuff. I love it. I love the vassal state energy, like the Game of Thrones kind of energy to it, too. It's pretty cool. So I'm going to break these up into segments stay tuned for the next video please like share and subscribe and i will see you on the next video